So Jesus went about doing his earthly ministry, preaching the gospel or the good news of the kingdom of God. Uh, in Matthew chapter 24, in verse 14, uh, you don't have to turn to it, but I'm going to read just a portion. And it says that, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then, Jesus says, and then shall the end come. We are commissioned to preach and to teach the kingdom, uh, the, the gospel, rather, of the kingdom of Almighty, Almighty God. So, so uh, we're going to talk about the rule and the rules pertaining to the kingdom of Almighty God. And number one, we're going to look at the king who reigns. The king reigns or the king rules. As we turn to New Testament, I'm just going to read one verse, Revelation chapter 11, in verse 15, as we work through the thought, the kingdom rules, the kingdom rules. Revelation chapter 11, I'm sorry, you know what, hold Revelation chapter 11 because we're coming back to it, but let's turn to, uh, hold Revelation chapter 11, and let's turn to 1 Chronicles chapter 29. 1 Chronicles chapter 29. And I'll start reading to you in verse 11. As we work through the thought, the kingdom rules. The kingdom rules. And number one, we must understand that Christ reigns, that Christ rules. He is the king of kings. He is the Lord of lords. He is in command. He rules. He reigns. And the unique thing about Christ is, he can fold his arms mm -hmm. and watch something happen, yeah. and he's still in control. Yeah. So, so, so your life, your life is never out so far out of control that Christ is not in charge. Yeah. But he's sovereign. He rules. He allows some things to happen, and then he causes other things to happen. But he's still ruling, and he's still in control. And, and still, and it, the fact is that all things, Christians, still are working together for our good. Yeah. Brother, the good things that happen in your life, the bad things that happen in your life, yeah. anything that's in between, because we are a part of the kingdom of Almighty God, because we have accepted Christ as our personal Lord and Savior. God has it set up in such a way that everything that hits your life is working for your good. The good things and the bad things that hit your life because of this sovereign rule, it, it, it will 
work for your good because you are called according to God's purpose. Yes. So the king rules. He's in charge. I don't care who's the, who the president is. I don't care who the governor is. God, I told you God can sit and can allow some things to happen and still be in control. And still work out his plan. And still work out his will for your life, for this assembly, for this country, and for the world. So the king rules. First Chronicles chapter 11. Are we in verse 11? And David is talking to David. is talking to the Lord. David said, Thine, O Lord, is the greatness. In other words, Lord, greatness belongs to you. Y'all with me? I know y'all think y'all great, but, but David is putting truth in. David said, Lord, greatness belongs to you. Greatness is yours, Lord. Y'all in verse 11? Greatness is yours, and the power, and the glory, and the victory, and the majesty all belongs to you. For all that is in heaven and all that is on, uh, in the earth is yours and thine is the kingdom. The kingdom belongs to you, O Lord. Thou art exalted as head above all. Look at verse 12. Lord, both riches and honor comes from you. Both riches and honor comes from you. And, and thou reigns over all, Lord. And in thine hand is power and might. And in thine hand it is to make great. In other words, Lord, it is you that causes folk to become great. It is you who exalts people and put people in power and put people in position for your purpose. Even wicked kings and even wicked leaders is God who exalts them and allows them to be in a position to work out his purpose. Yes. Yes. Look at verse... Um, did I read all of verse 13? And in thine hand is to make great. Okay. And that's what I like about the kingdom. That, that it is God who exalts. And, and it is God who puts people in position. And God, he, 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 he's concerned rather about all people. Even the humble. Even if you didn't get the education that you wanted to get. Even if you were born in poverty. God has the ability. If you are a child of God and you are in the kingdom of God. God has the ability to exalt you and to put you into a high place, to set you up on a rock, higher, higher than your enemies. So, so I like I like kingdom and not necessarily our religious bubbles or our religious kicks, uh, uh, clicks rather, but the kingdom of God is concerned about everybody from every walk of life. And that's what I love about the kingdom of God as opposed to some of our religious organizations. So, so uh, that's why David says in verse 13, And now, therefore, our God, we thank you and we praise your glorious name. The king is to be worshipped. He is to be praised. We are to praise him with all of our hearts, all of our mights, all of our strength. We know that he reigns. We know that he rules. We know that he controls every circumstance. God give us free will, but even when he allows us to, to do or make decisions, he's still in control. He's sovereign and he's in control. The king reigns or the king rules. Now let's look at Revelation chapter 11. I'm going to read verse 15. And I encourage you, if you are not saved, if you have not accepted Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, I encourage you to be a part of the kingdom of Almighty God. Amen. Someone was talking this morning in the Sunday school about, uh, about the world power of the world rule, of the world power, how, how the government is trying to, you know, how create this world rule, this, this world power or world, world rulership. Let's, let's look at this. Look at verse, look at verse uh, chapter 11 and verse 15. This is, why, this is why I encourage you to be a part of the kingdom of Almighty God. Amen. Look at verse 15. And this is the prophecy. Uh, and the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world. Did y'all see that? Amen. The kingdoms of this world. In other words, God has allowed Satan Amen. to rule for a season. So then there are the kingdom, there are kingdoms in this world, 
But but here but here it is. This is why we should come on over to the Lord's side. The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord. The kingdoms of this world shall be overtaken by the kingdom of Almighty God. Y'all with me? Make sure you are on the right team. Make sure you are involved in the right kingdom because the kingdom of Almighty God shall overtake the kingdoms of this world. And uh, the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ, he shall reign forever and ever. The king rules. The kingdom of God shall overtake the kingdoms of of this world. God is just allowing Satan to rule for a season and for his purpose. Y'all with me? Amen. The kingdom rules. The kingdom rules. Now, now let's look at the kingdom rules or the laws that govern the kingdom of Almighty God. Y'all with me? Yes, now let's look at the kingdom rules or the kingdom laws that, that governs the kingdom of Almighty God. And um, I'm, you don't have to turn to this, but I, I got uh, three things I want you to look at. St. John chapter 10, the very familiar passage. St. John chapter 10 and verse 9. And Jesus is talking. And Jesus says, I am the door. Yes, sir. And by me, if any man enters in, yes, he sir. shall be saved. And she'll go in and out and find pasture or find nourishment or yes. find fulfillment. Yes. Jesus says, in order to enter into my kingdom, I am the door. I am the only way to the kingdom of Almighty God. I am the door. There, there, there are no other ways other than all those other cults and religions. And despite popular belief, Jesus said, you know, some folk would tell you there's many ways to get to God. And there's many ways. And Christianity is not the only way. And Jesus says, anybody who's the, he says, all the other folk that came before me were thieves and robbers and liars. He says, I am the door to the kingdom of Almighty God. It, it, uh, let's, let's, uh, and he also says in verse 10, he says, but the thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy. Satan comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come that you might have life and that you might have this life to the fullest measure. Jesus says, I'm the door to the kingdom. But we are, listen to this now, we are instructed to preach the gospel of the good news pertaining to the kingdom. Uh, of course, you know, John preached that Christ was coming. And John preached, you know, uh, repent, you know, for Christ is coming. One who, who uh, is after me is preferred before me. And he, he, he preached the gospel of the good news of Jesus Christ. And Jesus came on the scene and Jesus started preaching the good news concerning the kingdom of God. In other words, don't just preach the door. Don't just preach that you should enter. When we go out to, into the highways and the byways, yes. we don't just preach that you should enter into the door or you should miss hell so you can get to heaven. But we, pre that we preach that once you enter into the door, that Christ reigns, Christ rules, and everything that you need is in the kingdom, in the realm of the kingdom of Almighty God. And we're going to look at some of the things that rule the kingdom of God. So it's not about just missing hell and getting to heaven, but we preach and teach the kingdom, the reign of Jesus Christ, the rule of Jesus Christ, and all that we have access to in the kingdom of God. Amen. That's what we preach, that's what we teach, and, and that's what's going to draw people into the kingdom of God. Amen. So Jesus says, I'm the door. Secondly, uh, now, we are going to turn to 1 Peter, chapter 2. We're almost there. Y'all hang in there now. 1 Peter, chapter 2. New Testament. I'm going to read one verse. Verse 9. And we're looking at the rules that govern the kingdom of Almighty God. Number one, the first rule is, Jesus, I'm the door. I'm the way. There is no other way to get into the kingdom of God. You must accept Christ by faith, as your personal Lord and Savior, He is the way, He is the door that enters the kingdom of Almighty God. Are we in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9? Yes, the kingdom rules, the rules that govern the kingdom of God. Peter says, but you are a chosen generation, 
a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him that has called you out of darkness into the marvelous light. Peter says you are a chosen generation, you are a royal priesthood. At the point that you accept Christ, I don't care what your background, I don't care you know, what your financial situation was, I don't care what sin you committed, I don't care what your reputation was back in the day, but once you accept Christ, once you come and become a part of God's family, you become royalty. You are a royal priesthood. You become a child of the King of Kings and a child of the Lord of Lords. So, so, so he says, you are a royal priesthood. And he says, you are a holy nation. You are a holy nation, a peculiar people. In other words, once you accept Christ, no more, no more trying to fit in, but you are a peculiar person. You are designed to be different. We are not arrogant because our Father is not arrogant, but we're designed to be different. You are a peculiar people. You're supposed to be different. You are not made to fit in with everybody else. You are a king's child. You are, you are royalty, so you have to walk different, and you have to talk different, and you have to think different. We are an extension of God's hands. We are an extension of God's feet. We are an extension of God's voice. You are royalty, and we represent the king of kings and the Lord. Lord. This is the king of rules. But here it is. Here it is. He says, now you are a peculiar people. You are a holy nation. You are a royalty, a chosen generation. He says, but here's the rule, Christians. Once you enter into the door by the way of Jesus Christ, you are to show forth the praises of him who called you out of darkness into the marvelous light. Stop being a secret Christian. Once you are saved and once you are royalty, you are to show forth the glory of Uh, by what I do or what I don't do. 
So this is bigger, Christians. This is bigger than us in our own household. We are a part of the kingdom of Almighty God, and he rules heaven and earth. He is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. He rules all. So, so, so it behooves us to walk and talk and to be a part of the kingdom of God by faith. Now, um, Jesus is the door. These are the rules. Jesus is the door that enters into the kingdom. We are to show forth the praises of God's glory in how we live. Um, St. John chapter 15, you don't have to turn to it, or please write it down. St. John chapter 15 and verse 7. Jesus is talking, and Jesus says, if you abide in me, y'all with me in St. John chapter 15 and verse 7, Jesus says, if you abide in me, that word abide means to stay. Yes. These are the rules, y'all. Now, y'all listen. If you abide in me, that word means stay. And if my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, yes. and it shall be done unto you. Here in verse 8, is my Father glorified that you bear or produce much fruit, so shall you be my disciples or my followers. He, this, this is the rules of the kingdom of God. Listen, listen Jesus is not, you know, we, we looked at how riches and honor comes from him. We, we looked at the fact that he is, he is exalted as head over all. And he is not teasing us with power. He is not teasing us with provision. He is not teasing us with the, with, the, with the ability or the power to drive out devils. He's not teasing us with the ability to heal our bodies when we are sick. He's not just dangling these things in the kingdom. He's not dangling these things and teasing us and look what I got, but you can't have it. He says, if you abide in me and allow my word to abide or to stay in you, you ask what you will. This is how it works in the kingdom, y'all. You ask what you will in Jesus' name. He says, this shall be given unto you that my Father might be glorified thereby. So every time as we walk and talk with him and as we allow the word of God to abide in us, and as we abide in the word of God, because you can't abide in the word and allow the word of God to abide in you and ask God for crazy stuff that won't bring him glory. But as you abide in him and allow his words to abide in you, he says, ask what you want and I'll give it to you. That my father might be glorified. So every time God answers a prayer for you, you give praise to God and God gets glory. Every time God works it out, you give praise to God and it gives God glory. Every time he turns that situation around. Every time he works a miracle, every time he heals your body, every time he defies the doctor's report, yes. he gives him praise and he glorifies his father in heaven. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. This is part of the rules. If you abide in him and he abide in you, that's what you will, Jesus says. And he has authority. He says, and I'll give it to you. And I'll give it to you. These are the kingdom rules. These are the kingdom rules. And we must realize that Christ the King, he reigns and he rules. And all power is in his hand. Everything we need is in the kingdom of Almighty God. This is what we teach. This is what we preach. We preach the kingdom. We preach that the king rules. We preach that he reigns. We preach and teach all that we have access, the power and authority that we have in the kingdom of God. We preach what, 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 what Jesus said. We are to preach the kingdom, the good news, rather, of the kingdom of God. And then when and the Bible says, Jesus says that when all the world has heard the message of the good news pertaining to the kingdom, we don't just preach the door. We don't just preach come in, come in, come in, come in and live a uh, defeated life. Uh, come on in, come on in, to, uh, come on over to the Lord's side and you're still living in sin. Come on over to the Lord's side and you're not experiencing any victory. No, we preach that you have access to power and authority and victory in the kingdom of Almighty God. Father, I thank you for the fact that the kingdom rules. Doesn't matter who's president, Lord. Doesn't matter who, who's governor, who's, who think 
that they're in charge, Lord, but you, you're running it. You're running things, Lord, and nothing surprises you. Uh, uh, and you, you taught us, Lord, that that it is law that the, the 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 spirit of life, the spirit of life, has set us free from the spirit of sin and death. The law of the spirit of life has set us free. Those who have accepted Christ has set us free from the law of sin and death. We are governed by your laws, Lord. Those who have accepted you, we are governed by your laws, and we will believe your report, and not the report of others. We will believe your promises. We will stand on your promises, Lord. We will stand on your word. We will stand on your prophecies, Lord. We are governed by your laws. We are governed by your rules, and we put our faith in what you've said, and we stand on the promises, Lord, despite the doctor's report, despite the naysayers, Lord. Even concerning the vision for this ministry, that which is based upon the word of God, we stand on the word of God, Lord. Despite how things look, Lord, we're going to abide, we're going to stay until the fruit comes to pass. Thank you for what you have planned and scheduled for this assembly. And we will forever give you the glory. In Jesus' name, we praise you and we thank you, Lord. Amen. Let's give God a hand clap of praise for the word of God. Hallelujah. to my world, where it's naturally supernatural. Many people believe that T.L. Osborne had more miracles and salvations than anyone in history. But when a Messianic Jewish rabbi showed him how to be in proper alignment, so much glory appeared. T.L had to adjust his theology. Next on It's Supernatural. Is there a supernatural dimension? A world beyond the one we know? Can we tap into ancient secrets of the supernatural? Can our dreams contain messages from heaven? Is God ready to bring a tsunami wave of healing onto planet Earth today? Sid Roth has spent over 40 years researching the strange world of the supernatural. Join Sid for this edition of It's Supernatural. So, uh, T.L. Osborne who, I, I'll tell you, this man walked in such miracles and so many salvations uh, that uh, he's, he's in Africa, and he used to go to, you know, foreign countries, and that's why he isn't as well known in the United States. But he, he was in Africa having a meeting, and he keeps saying at the end of his meeting, the rabbi is coming, the rabbi is coming. Well, guess what? I got the rabbi here that was coming, Rabbi Kurt Landry. Rabbi, take me to this. You, you go to, uh, where was this in Africa? We went to Togo. Oh, well-known place. Yes. And, and you, so you went to Togo, you get there, the expectancy level had to be sky high. He kept saying, you think this is good. The rabbi is coming. So, Rabbi, you come. Uh, what happened? It was so powerful that when we were there, we knew that if we brought the one new man that the Apostle Paul was speaking about in Ephesians chapter 2, 
that God would do exceedingly abundantly above all we could ask or think. We knew, we had great expectation, but at this point we have never done it in a large, uh, you know, healing environment like this. There was probably 35, 40,000 people in this soccer field. This was the first night. It grew to 50,000, you know, af by the third night. And uh, so Christy and I got up, we did the repentance. Uh, I spoke the blessing over them. They received it. And, and I mean, it was being translated into three languages and, and I was speaking it in English and it was drowning out the, the, the next two languages, Togonese and, and French. And it was just absolutely so powerful. And uh, Dr. Osborne purposely hung back and he says, I'm gonna, I'm gonna come up on the platform once you have set the atmosphere according to what we had discussed. And as soon as he came up on the platform, he was not speaking any longer than five to seven minutes. And then off to the left, I'll never forget it. This was life changing for him and for myself. Off to the left, probably about 10 or 15 people back, there was a woman and she was screaming. And, uh, and, and Dr. Osborne was very sensitive. He taught me this. He says, anytime you're doing an outreach, always look for God's trigger. Let God tr choose the trigger point. Don't, don't, go, don't get ahead of God. Preach, preach your message. But he didn't even... I mean, what a privilege you had. He mentored you on the secrets that, so they didn't go to the grave so you could release them, but go ahead. But he was so sensitive. That, that, that lady was the trigger. And he, and I'll never forget, he looked over Sid and he said, Mama, 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 come on up here. So he had some of his uh, people bring her up on the platform. And uh, at this point, Dr. Osborne was standing on the platform and I was sitting down with all the pastors around the back. And they gave us strict instruction. And you know me, I'm, I'm a man of honor and I, I'm under authority. But as soon as he started to speak to this woman, I jumped up out of my seat and I literally stood like right here, right next to him. Uh, I would, and I, sh I shouldn't have, but I was just standing there and I looked into this beautiful woman's eyes and uh, she, she had like glaucoma and just white all in her in her eyes and, and uh, she, the reason she screamed because her eyes miraculously opened and she could see. And uh, yeah, praise the Lord. You know, we've had lots of testimonies of this happening, but what's it like to watch it happen right before your eyes? Well, th this is the thing about Dr. Osborne is he, he didn't want any phony miracles. He wanted to make sure. So of course he did the fingers and she could count the fingers and that was great. But he asked her how she went blind. And evidently, it was her second pregnancy. She had a spinal injury and she had lost her sight. And so Dr. Osborne, very uh, wise, he said, well, do you have children? She says, yes, I have five children. And all this is documented. So he says, yes, you have five children. So then he said, well, you mean you have children you have not seen? She says, yes. And Dr. Osborne said, is there any of her children that are here that she wow. has not seen? Would you bring them up on the platform? And sure enough, here comes this beautiful young man. So the man. first time in her life she can see her own children. Yeah. So I'm standing there and, I, and I'm not supposed to be standing there. I didn't think about it until afterwards, but I'm just standing there like, okay, now we're going to see, you know. And uh, uh, so, uh, you know, the scripture says the Jews need a sign. So I'm standing right there. And this beautiful young man comes up and stares at his mother and no reaction from her. She's looking at him and I, you can tell she does not know who he is. And she went up. And she took her hands and went and grabbed his face and started to feel his features from the top of his head, around his eyes, his cheekbones, his lips. And she broke and she just fell to her knees and started to praise the Lord. And as soon as she did that, a wave of glory went out from that platform. The Royal Rangers who were around keeping people uh, like 15 or 20 feet from the platform, that all caved in. People rushed the platform. Wheelchairs were flying in the air. Crutches were flying in the air. But here's the point I want to make. This man of God was used to seeing miracles. But what did he say the, the difference between what he was used to and what occurred was? On this experience, what he was saying is that I've never seen healing and miracle signs and wonders without me even preaching. You know, it's the chemistry, if you will, 
of the one new man. I mean, God has been waiting. Uh, almost the saints in, the, uh, in heaven are looking over the balcony of heaven. When will the Gentile Christian and the Jewish believer be one in my body so my body can have and release the full power of God. And Rabbi, that's what you're saying you witness, Absolutely. the release of the full power of God. Rabbi Landry says, just as the identity of the church was hijacked, so was his. Find out what happened when his identity was stolen and how it changed his life when it was restored and how it will change your life. Be right back. We will be right back to It's Supernatural! We now return to It's Supernatural! You teach that the church's biblical heritage was robbed. When was it robbed and what was it robbed of? Well, during the Constantine period, uh, you know, there was, uh, when the Romans couldn't control the, the, the Jewish church, the, the true believers, and they had to change uh, its identity by changing its culture and its calendar. So if you remove people from your culture, then you're going to lose your identity, and you change their calendar, and you're going to lose your blessings. You know, we know as Jews that, uh, that in Exodus, that just putting your feet under the table of Psalms 23, the Lord prepare a table for us in the midst of our enemies. That's the Passover table. There's nine blessings of provision and uh, uh, vision, protection, and uh, multiplication and prosperity for your family. And so all that, all that wisdom, knowledge, but most of all, identity. And Sid, you know this, identity is the key to the glory because identity has to do with personal intimacy that turns into a corporate intimacy and then turns into a congregational intimacy where people are being healed. And that's what happened in Togo. The alignment was there, Jew and Gentile, and the Lord literally prepared a table for us, let's say, in that soccer field, and there was multitudes of miracles. And it happened many other places. Now, well. you um, have firsthand knowledge of what it's like to have your identity stolen. Yours was stolen at birth. Tell me briefly what happened. Um, I was conceived out of wedlock, Jewish mother, Gentile father. Uh, and because of that, uh, both families said no to the marriage. So then they set up for an abortion. Three days before the abortion was uh, going to happen, my father, the Catholic, went to the Catholic priest on the Air Force Base and said, the uh, Jewish woman could go into Los Angeles and have the child born in a hospital there, a Catholic hospital, and put into a uh, Catholic orphanage. That's where I was there. I now, you pay attention to this, what he's sharing, because this is also what happened to the church. But go ahead. Yeah. And uh, so then I was six months in the orphanage. I was colicky. I was put in with the bad babies. And then, praise God, Ray and Rita Landry, Catholic man, Jewish woman again, the Lord's making his point, comes back and they adopt me at six months. You know, I went from being labeled, basically, first label is bastard, next one is orphan, next one is adopted, and then the next one is no identity, Jew or Gentile. And uh, then when I was born again at age 36, uh, I spiritually got visited by the Lord when I uh, was involved in a messianic wedding. but. Two years, or uh, three years after, it's in my book, three years after um, I was saved, I miraculously was reconnected with my biological father that told me the story. And so I found out, whew, excuse me, I found out that... You, you had, by the way, you had no desire to meet them. You loved your, the parents that adopted right, you. Right, yeah. Uh, you, uh, but, w so why did you meet him? The Lord had me stay home from work, and uh, and you know me well. I'm I work hard. I'm a Type A, and uh, I stayed home and I prayed, and I had a download from the Holy Spirit. And I operate as a prophet, and the Lord said, "I I want you to find your biological father," and 
and I listened to it and I ignored it. And next day I was going to go to work and the Lord said, stay home that day. And I was on the floor in my office at home and he said, uh, I want you to find your biological father. And I said, I don't want to open that can of worms. And the Lord says, when I open a can of worms, I take care of all the worms. And five phone calls later, I miraculously found my father in Palm Beach, Florida. And uh, he, he said, I would love to meet you. And at that time I was in the fruit business. Public supermarket was one of my accounts. And of course they have a, uh, a distribution center in Miami. And so I flew into Miami, drove to Palm Beach and sat in a little cafe. And I watched my, you know, 25 year old self walking into that. Literally, we look just alike. He literally was walking in. We have a little different waddly walk. Here he comes walking in. And uh, uh, it was just like, it was so healing. And that night, as the Lord said, that night I got to share with him uh, my testimony and had the honor and privilege of lead, leading my biological father to the Lord the first night. <laughs> What, when you found out that you are Jewish, um, that's good, but how did it change you, Kurt? That's what I want to know. You know, it, it's, it's a spiritual thing. It has to do with honesty and integrity to the Lord, that you're being true to yourself. And, uh, you know, people ask me to write books for years. I've been in ministry a long time. But when Thomas Nelson came and said, listen, there's so much confusion over in the evangelical community and in, and in our, uh, our community that we sell our books to over the Jewish roots. There's so much. And they said, listen, we know your testimony. Would you share with us, would you write a book and parallel your 63 years to the church? And because we feel like the Holy Spirit's bringing the church back to its roots. I'll tell you, I'll tell you what, Kurt. It is so amazing when you really find out how the identity of the church was stolen. This, this Emperor Constantine, uh, he literally made it uh, illegal to observe anything Jewish. He denuded the church of its identity. Well, the church is ready to get its identity back. You know who the church is? It's us. It's you. It's people. That's right. When we come back, I want to find out how to get our identity back. <laughs> I'll tell you, we're having so much fun. How does uh, 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 living in sync with God's calendar make a, a difference in us? The biggest thing it does is it shows him that he is the Lord. And that's what brings the glory. He is the Lord. You know, in Hebrew, we call it moed, M-O-E-D. That means God orders Passover. God invites you at Passover, at Pentecost, Shavuot. He, he invites you to these. He things. actually goes even stronger. He says these are, he doesn't say these are Jewish feasts. These are the feasts he of the Lord. He says these are my feasts. That, that puts it in a whole different dimension. Let me ask you something. Do you have to observe the Passover to have your sins atoned for? Do you have to observe the Passover to have God love you more? No. No, it's not about salvation. What is it about? Relationship. He's your daddy. It's your father. And you know this is the key. This is what got released in Taiwan. The last service I was there, I released the Father's love. And when we did, we just literally took our hands out like this, and you could just see waves of rows of people just falling in the Spirit, crying and weeping, because there's been so much torment, particularly for the indigenous uh, the Balumbi tribe that's there. The indigenous Taiwanese people were there in this service. And, uh, you know, their identity has been, has been dishonored. So when you come with the love of the Father, the only thing that reek, the only, uh, we have a saying, only your Father can name you. And you know that in Hebrew, it's very important. 
and uh, you know we're Jewish because of our mother but we are our father is the one that names you and so when we release that father's love the glory falls would it be okay with studio audience and you at home if I ask him to release the father's love <laughs> anyone interested I am too <laughs> Would you do that right now? We'll do that. Father God, we come to you in Yeshua's name. And Lord, we are all battling that orphan spirit. We are being bombarded by the airways and every device that there is trying to steal our identity. And Lord, I thank you that your word says it's the anointing that breaks the yoke. Break that yoke of that orphan spirit. Break that yoke off that poverty. Break that yoke off that false counterfeit identity. And Lord, I ask now that you release the Father's love. I thank you, Lord, that perfect love casts out all fear and faith works through love. So Lord, I just, if I just lay hands on you right now and I decree that you would be all that you are called to be, just, just as Jacob blessed Manasseh, and he blessed Ephraim. He took his right hand and put it on the second born, the church, because the first born Jew, Ephraim, already had, already had the, uh, the, the anointing and that blessing. So Lord, I release that blessing of the Father's love to first born and the second born as one new man in Yeshua's mighty name. Wow. But I'll tell you, talk about born. Some of you just have religion, whether it's Hinduism, Judaism, uh, uh, and any, any ism, but do you have relationship with the living God? Do you have your own experiential knowledge with the living God? And of course you want this. Say this prayer with me out loud, and that is your entry into having the relationship you were created to have to call Father God, Daddy. Repeat after me out loud. Dear God, Dear God I'm, a I'm a sinner, and I'm so sorry. And I'm so sorry. I, believe to the best of my I believe to the best of my knowledge that the blood of Jesus, blood of Jesus washes away all of my sins, away all of my sins. and I am clean. And now that I am clean, I ask you, Jesus, to come inside of me. Be my Lord. I want to hear your voice. I want to be a well-done type of son, one that really is, you're happy with. I want to experience the fullness of your love. Amen. Next week on It's Supernatural. Hello, I'm Dr. Hakeem Collins, and I have a revelation from God that will equip you to receive and release healing power. He says you're a commander, and you've been given authority over sickness, disease, oppression, and every evil work of the enemy. Join me on the next It's Supernatural with Sid Raw and get ready to assume your command.